Smog, the chief among the four great dragons in Middle-earth, is covered in impenetrable scales. His fiery breath can melt anything in its path. In front of him, the dragons in Game of Thrones can only be considered his younger siblings. Wherever it goes, devastation follows. Leaving nothing but desolation, Smog was lured by the treasure within the Dwarven Palace and came from the north. With his scorching dragon fire, he forcefully seized the Dwarves' Palace, claiming all the gold and silver for himself, and forced the Dwarves into a life of exile and hardship. Many years later, Gandalf, who was dedicated to protecting Middle-earth, discovered that the forces of darkness were awakening to prevent Smog from allying with the dark forces. Gandalf planned to assemble a team to help the dwarves reclaim their homeland and eliminate Smog in the process. However, they were constantly pursued by orcs throughout their journey. With the help of giant eagles, the group managed to escape numerous obstacles. Standing at the highest point, they finally caught sight of the magnificent dwarven kingdom, signaling that their destination was within reach. As night fell, Bilbo took on the responsibility of keeping watch. Not only did he spot the relentless pursuit of the orcs, but he also witnessed a giant black bear roaring at them. This black bear's name was Bjorn, a powerful shape-shifting being who protected the forest. Whenever he encountered orcs, he transformed into a massive bear to drive them away. Bilbo hurriedly returned to the group to report what he had seen to Gandalf. Gandalf was already familiar with this black bear. The situation was dire, as the orc army would soon catch up to them. Guided by their scent, Gandalf suggested they backtrack and find an alternate route. He knew of a nearby house where they could seek refuge from the orcs. Thorin, the vigilant dwarf prince, inquired about whether the house's owner would be a friend or a foe. Gandalf replied that he was uncertain, perhaps he would assist them through the ordeal, or perhaps he would kill them, with no better options at hand. They proceeded with the plan. However, just as they were discussing, the howling of the orcs' wargs suddenly echoed through the air. Azek, accompanied by his wargs' army, chased them relentlessly from night until dawn. The group raced against time and finally reached the house, but the orcs were yet to arrive. In their haste, they managed to close the wooden door, blocking the bear's attack. What is that? That is our host. It turned out that the owner of the house was none other than the black bear, Bjorn. When he transforms into his beastly form, Bjorn becomes fierce and formidable. However, in his human form, he exhibits a gentle and human-like personality. Originally, his family lived a simple life in the Misty Mountains until orcs appeared and annihilated his entire family, leaving only him behind. Bjorn harbors a deep hatred for orcs. Knowing that Thorin, the dwarf prince, is also an enemy of orcs, he warmly welcomes them. The next day, Bjorn lends them a white horse to aid them on their journey. Their plan is to pass through Mirkwood Forest and head to the Lonely Mountain. As they arrive at the forest's entrance, they sense an ominous presence. For unknown reasons, the forest has been corrupted by an unseen darkness. To shorten their journey, the group unanimously decides to venture through the forest. Leading the way, Gandalf discovers dark magical symbols on the trees, reminding him of the words spoken by the elven queen, Galadriel. They must uncover the mastermind behind the dark forces. Gandalf decides to venture alone to Rivendell to uncover the truth. Before departing, he instructs the others not to lose their way and to take the elf path, strictly avoiding the water within the forest. The rivers there are infused with dark magic, and they must remain alert. The forest's air creates illusions, and Gandalf assures them that he will reunite with the group before they reach the Lonely Mountain. The entire forest is enveloped in darkness, with no glimpse of sunlight. The air is thin and filled with a pervasive sense of darkness, causing great discomfort. They find that the bridge leading to the elf path has been broken. Gandalf had warned them not to touch the water within the forest. Therefore, Bilbo, with his broad feet, is sent to test the stability of the vines nearby. During the climbing process, Bilbo nearly falls into the water. He realizes that the reflections in the river appear eerie and quickly climbs to the other side, clearing his mind to stay alert. Before he can explain his suspicions to the others, stay where you are! Oh. the dwarves have already hurriedly crossed. Suddenly, a strange white deer approaches them. Thorin immediately pulls out his bow and shoots an arrow to drive it away. Bilbo considers this an ill omen, as expected. The heaviest dwarf falls into the water due to lack of oxygen. The remaining four must carry him, adding to their burdensome journey. After walking a few steps, the group starts to feel drowsy as if under the influence of a hypnotic spell. The dwarves find a familiar tobacco pouch along the way. Only Bilbo's mind remains clear, 
reminding him that the pouch actually belongs to him. They realize they have been going in circles. No matter what Bilbo says, it seems the others can't hear him, as they argue amongst themselves. Bilbo climbs to the highest point of a tree to assess the direction and discovers the air above to be incredibly clear. Bathed in the sunset's glow, a group of butterflies dances gracefully. He spots a river in the distance, along with their destination, the Lonely Mountain. Bilbo shouts to his companions on the ground to convey the direction, but he receives no response. When he descends back into the forest, he finds himself entangled in spider webs. Suddenly, a giant spider appears before him, bearing its fangs. They have unwittingly stumbled into the spider's nest. As the spider drags its recent catch, preparing to unwrap its meal, Bilbo swiftly plunges a sword into its chest. In its struggle, Bilbo pushes it off the tree. He quickly tears off the disgusting spider webs from his body and discovers that the rest of his companions have been wrapped up like mummies by the spiders. Bilbo finally realizes that they have entered the spider's nest. More and more spiders approach. He holds his breath, afraid to make any sudden movements. Suddenly, he remembers the precious treasure he found earlier. The One Ring. By wearing it, he can instantly become invisible. Furthermore, Bilbo can hear the spiders' conversations. If he doesn't intervene and rescue his companions, they will become the spiders' feast. Bilbo throws a piece of wood behind him to distract their attention. Indeed, the spiders run over to investigate the noise. But one spider remains, ready to devour them. Bilbo decisively strikes the spider's hindquarters with a sword. When the spider turns around to inspect, it sees nothing. Bilbo proceeds to sever two of the spider's legs. With the ring, Bilbo feels as though he has gained an incredible advantage. Bilbo released all twelve of his companions, and the dwarves, waking up from their stupor, tore through the spider webs. However, the danger was far from over. Another spider, with its mouth full of fangs, suddenly lunged at Bilbo. The two became entangled and fell from the tree. In the struggle, Bilbo's precious ring accidentally slipped from his finger. Losing the one ring made Bilbo anxious, and he frantically searched for it. Meanwhile, a large number of spiders quickly surrounded them from the front. The dwarves managed to kill two spiders in quick succession, but one of the spiders targeted the chubby dwarf who couldn't run as fast as the others. Knocking him to the ground, the rest of the group rushed over, each person grabbing his spider leg. While Bilbo continued searching for his ring, he seemed oblivious to the imminent danger faced by his companions. Ever since he obtained the one ring, he felt like a changed person. Losing the ring was akin to losing his very soul. Just as he was about to reach for the ring, a spider suddenly crawled towards him. However, Bilbo cast aside his fear and displayed astonishing abilities to kill the giant spiders. As he picked up the one ring, he began to reflect on himself. He realized that he had become irritable, restless, and had lost his sanity. But regardless, the ring had saved him in times of crisis, and he didn't want to lose it. Just as they had dealt with one wave of spiders, another wave approached. Just as Thorin was preparing to pick up his large sword and engage in combat, a nimble man leaped down from a tree, gracefully stepping on a spider and using it as a makeshift skateboard, then swiftly sliding past another spider, the elven prince Legolas. Accompanied by his team, arrived in style, he was the son of Thranduil, the king of the nearby woodland realm. However, they had not come to aid the dwarves but to capture them. As tensions rose among the group, Keely, one of the dwarves, suddenly fell victim to a spider attack and was bitten on the leg. At that moment, another elven beauty appeared. Quick! If you think I'm giving you a weapon, dwarf, you're mistaken! With her own strength alone, she swiftly killed several spiders. The appearance of the elves instantly repelled all the giant spiders. The dwarves dared not make any sudden moves. During their search, they came across a family photo album belonging to one of the dwarves. The woman with a beard on the left side was his wife. It turned out that dwarves, regardless of gender, grew beards. In the subsequent The Lord of the Rings series, Gimli becomes Legolas' most important companion. To the elves' surprise, they discovered an ancient elven sword among the dwarves. The elves already had a mistrustful attitude towards the dwarves, and this discovery further confused them. Legolas ordered them all to be taken back to the palace and locked in the dungeon. Did anyone notice someone missing? Bilbo was not with the group. Sure enough, 
he had quietly put on the ring and escaped unnoticed. Just as the doors were closing, he slipped into the elven palace. Bilbo stealthily made his way into the elves' dungeon to help the twelve dwarves escape. Before alerting the guards, they managed to reach the wine cellar warehouse. Bilbo had already devised an escape plan, all twelve dwarves would climb into the barrels. Although the dwarves expressed their confusion, they had no better options at the moment and had to go along with his plan. Bilbo pulled the lever with all his might, and the barrels rolled down the river along the tracks. The loud noise woke up the drunken guard. Bilbo seemed to realize that something was amiss. He was eager to help the dwarves escape and didn't consider himself only to realize that there were no more barrels available. It was quite embarrassing. Seeing the guards approaching, Bilbo felt scared and took several steps back, only to fall into the river himself. The dwarves stayed behind. Waiting for him, the group floated downstream along the river. Soon, they approached the first waterfall. Fortunately, the barrels were of excellent quality, and everyone made it through smoothly. However, the elven guards quickly discovered their escape and immediately sounded the horn, commanding the guards downstream to close the water gates. Just as the guard drew their swords to capture them, a poisoned arrow came flying towards him from behind. It turned out that an orc legion had been lying in wait for them all along. A large group of orcs climbed up the city walls and eliminated the elven guards. Leading them was Balg, the son of Azik, since Azig had been summoned back to the fortress by his master to command the army, the task of hunting down the dwarves had been entrusted to Balk. The orcs quickly descended into the river and approached them, except for Bilbo. The others had no weapons and had to rely on hand-to-hand -hand combat to seize weapons from the orcs. Realizing that this was not a sustainable strategy, Keeley decided to charge towards the riverbank in an attempt to open the floodgate. Along the way, he killed several orcs, catching the attention of Balk who took aim with his bow and shot Keeley in the leg. The poisoned arrow quickly spread through his body, and soon Keeley could no longer stand and fell to the ground. At a critical moment, the elven maiden Toriel arrived to provide support. And Legolas also came with his guards to stop the orcs. Although the dwarves were their captives, eliminating the orcs was their priority. The three factions clashed in a chaotic battle. Keeley seized the opportunity to drag his injured leg and struggled to open the floodgate. The dwarven floated downstream along the swift river. Keeley exerted all his strength and jumped into an empty barrel, successfully escaping danger. However, Balg quickly ordered his subordinates to intercept them. Toriel and Legolas followed closely behind, killing multiple orcs along the way to protect the dwarves. The orcs leaped down with their spears and pierced the barrel of the chubby dwarf. Under the impact of the river, the barrel was launched onto the riverbank, crushing multiple orcs along the way. The chubby dwarf kicked off the bottom of the barrel, wielding his double axes and spinning relentlessly. Then he passed his weapons to his companions and jumped into another barrel. Legolas performed a breathtaking solo act, leaping into the center of the river and landing with both feet on two dwarves. With his precise shooting, he relentlessly crushed every orc in his path. The elven prince not only possessed an unmatched beauty but also displayed incredible combat skills. He ultimately repelled all the orcs, capturing one of them to bring back for interrogation in the palace. Under the intense questioning of elven king Thranduil, the orc revealed a shocking and earth-shattering secret. They learned that their master, Sauron, was about to re-emerge in Middle-earth and had formed an alliance with various dark forces. In a fit of anger, Thranduil decapitated the orc and ordered a doubling of patrols along the borders. On the other side, the dwarves finally reached the shore. But Keeley's condition was worsening, delaying the group's progress. While resting, a mysterious individual took up his bow and arrow, launching an attack towards them. Do it again? And you're dead. The unarmed dwarves dared not make any sudden movements. One elderly dwarf recognized him as a resident of Eskaroth. The path to the Lonely Mountain had to pass through Eskaroth, and the dwarves offered a handsome reward if he could guide them across. Inside 13 barrels of wine on the boat were hidden 13 dwarves, along with a pile of fish, as they planned to smuggle themselves into Eskaroth. Upon reaching the toll gate and undergoing cargo inspection, Bard, as usual, presented his permit for inspection, he then claimed to be hungry and cold, urging them to expedite the process. The inspector, 
having no intention of causing trouble, was about to let them through, however, another inspector, who had taken a dislike to Bard, decided to find fault with him, stating that he was merely a boatman and not a fisherman, he ordered his subordinates to pour all the fish into the river, Bard, at that moment, was also sweating nervously and pleaded desperately, he spoke at length and managed to convince the inspector to spare them, Quieting starts. Stop. Eskaroth was located at the foot of the Lonely Mountain, next to a town called Rivertown. Since Rivertown had been destroyed by smog, Eskaroth lost its trading connection with it. The once prosperous town was gradually declining, governed by an inept mayor, and its people were suffering. The dwarves emerged from the barrels and made their way to Bard's house. From the window, Thorin noticed the black arrow bow crafted by the dwarves. It turned out that Bard's ancestors were descendants of the former mayor of Rivertown. It was their ancestors who had used the black arrow bow to repel Smog when he attacked. Although they failed to kill Smog with it due to his impenetrable scales, they firmly believed that one more arrow shot into his weak spot would slay it. Bard accepted their generous payment and promised to provide them with the weapons they needed. However, when he opened the package, it turned out to be fishing tools. They are about to face the formidable dragon smog, and the dwarves wonder how they can reclaim the lonely mountain with such meager equipment. It seems they will have to rely on themselves. In the evening, the dwarven party secretly infiltrates the town's armory. Now these are proper weapons. Each person takes up a weapon, intending to depart for the lonely mountain tonight. Just as they were preparing to leave, Keeley's injured leg caused him to unfortunately fall down the stairs creating a loud noise that catches the attention of the guards outside. As expected, they are caught red-handed, and all of them are apprehended by the guards. The group is escorted to the presence of the mayor, awaiting judgment. At this moment, the dwarven prince Thorin steps forward decisively and boldly reveals his identity as a member of the House of Durin. He tells them that their purpose for coming is to defeat Smog and reclaim their homeland. As long as they help them retake the Lonely Mountain, everyone present will share in the gold, and Eskaroth will be restored to its former prosperity. This was no forsaken town on a lake. This was the center of all trade in the north. I would see those days return. I would relight the great forges of the dwarves and send wealth and riches flowing once more from the halls of Erebor. Thorin's words stir the greed of the mayor, who is tempted by the promise of wealth. Bard steps forward to oppose Thorin, stating that they have been blinded by greed. If they awaken Smog, they may not be able to defeat him, and Eskaroth will suffer the same fate as Rivertown. Bard suggests that they should not take such a risk. Thorin assures everyone once again that if they defeat Smog, he will share the mountain's treasure with them all. Excited by the temptation of riches, the crowd becomes enthusiastic, and even the mayor announces his support for the dwarves. The next day, the town provides the dwarves with full armor and equipment. Due to Keeley's severe injuries, he must remain in Eskaroth to recuperate. The mayor organizes a grand farewell ceremony to bid them farewell. After several days of arduous journeying, they finally catch sight of the lonely mountain. Now in ruins, once a prosperous river town, time is running out, and they must find the secret door to enter the lonely mountain before sunset. However, Bilbo remembers Gandalf's instructions that they must wait for him to join them before entering the lonely mountain. But Thorin, impatient at this moment, has no patience to wait for Gandalf's arrival. Meanwhile, Gandalf prepared to investigate the tomb of the Witch King of Anmar. Suddenly, a loose step breaks, causing an 80-year-old Gandalf's blood pressure to soar, nearly causing him to fall off the cliff. He finally enters the stone door, only to discover numerous traps hidden inside. Gandalf narrowly avoided falling into the deep well. He cast a spell, causing his staff to emit a bright light, illuminating the entire cave. As expected, the iron gate had been damaged, and the stone coffin inside had been opened. Suddenly, a bat flew out aggressively, revealing itself to be Radagast, the brown wizard. Gandalf informed him that the nine ring wraiths only obeyed one master. The forces of darkness were about to invade Middle-earth once again. The appearance of the goblins, orcs, and the dragon smog, whom they encountered before, all served this master. Azig was the commander of the orc army. A fierce war between humans and orcs was inevitable, and the battle would take place at the foot of the lonely mountain known as the Battle of the Five Armies. After finishing his explanation, Gandalf was eager to join the dwarves' company. However, Radagast suggested that Gandalf should first explore Helm's Deep, 
the place where Sauron was sealed. Therefore, Gandalf formed an expeditionary team to go to the Lonely Mountain and prevent this disaster before the dragon awakened. Their mission was twofold, to help the dwarves reclaim their homeland and to prevent Smog from allying with the forces of darkness. They hurriedly arrived at the Lonely Mountain as the sun set on Durin's day, following the instructions of the moon runes on the map. The secret door to the Lonely Mountain was located on this wall. Thorin took the key to the secret door and was filled with mixed emotions, almost shedding tears of excitement. After 60 years, the dwarves finally returned to their home and were about to witness the glory and immense wealth of their ancestors. Thorin constantly remembered the hint translated by Elrond, the last light of Durin's day would shine upon the keyhole, and now was the perfect time to open the secret door. The dwarves used spoons to tap on the stone wall, trying to find the hollow spot, but their time was running out. The sun was about to set, and missing this opportunity meant waiting for another year. The impatient dwarves completely lost their patience and resorted to brute force, wielding their axes recklessly, but still couldn't locate the keyhole. As the last ray of sunlight disappeared beyond the horizon, the aged dwarves called a halt to the reckless actions of the others. All their hopes were shattered. Thorin silently watched the direction where the sunset vanished. He couldn't bear to accept it and once again recited the hint from the map. The last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. That's what it says. What did we miss? Now, with the daylight gone, it signaled the end of their expedition. The dwarves turned around in silence and prepared to leave down the mountain. But Bilbo did not leave. He tried to encourage everyone not to give up, but Thorin could only see despair. The key in his hand was useless to them. He threw the map to Bilbo and followed the rest of the team, leaving the place. Bilbo, holding onto the spirit of never giving up, continued to study the clues. When the dense clouds parted, the delayed moonlight made its appearance. It turned out that the mentioned lingering light didn't necessarily refer to sunlight. A thrush gently tapped on the wall, and moonlight pierced through the gaps in the mountain, directly shining on the lock. The keyhole! Come back! Come back! It's the light of the moon! The last moon of autumn! Bilbo shouted loudly but received no response from his companions. He remembered the key that Thorin had just discarded. As he searched frantically on the ground, he accidentally kicked the key away. A firm and powerful foot stepped on the key just in time. Thorin, who hadn't gone far, came back with the rest of the dwarves. All eyes were on Bilbo, with grateful smiles on their faces. Most of all, they were deeply moved by Bilbo's unwavering spirit. Thorin inserted the key into the lock and pushed the stone door forward with force. At that moment when the door was opened, all the dwarves stood still, unable to express their excitement in words. After 60 years, the dwarves finally set foot once again in their once glorious kingdom, Erebor. The elderly dwarves were overcome with tears of excitement. Now, they were about to fulfill their mission and reclaim the Arkenstone. All eyes turned to Bilbo once again. Gandalf had chosen him to join the group, waiting for this moment. As a burglar, Bilbo naturally couldn't refuse, but he didn't know what the Arkenstone looked like. The dwarves told him there was only one Arkenstone, and he would know it when he saw it. Bilbo cautiously walked into the palace. Apart from the magnificent architectural landscape, the mountain of piled up gold before his eyes astonished him. The lonely mountain had more gold than all the gold in the world combined. With light footsteps, Bilbo ventured into the golden mountain, trying to avoid the sound of coins falling. Finding the Arkenstone amidst the mountain of gold was like finding a needle in a haystack. Arkenstone. A large and white jewel. Very helpful. Bilbo casually picked up a golden cup unaware that it would trigger a cascade of rolling coins. Suddenly, a massive eye appeared, startling him. He quickly hid behind a pillar, attempting to go the other way. Bilbo noticed the dragon's tail still slowly moving. He measured Smog's length with his hand, preparing to leave unnoticed. Smog, awakened by the disturbance, started approaching him. Bilbo hid behind the mountain of gold. Not daring to take a breath, Smog revealed his majestic dragon head. In this dire situation, Bilbo's thoughts turned to the one ring in his pocket. He quickly put it on and became invisible. Although Smog couldn't see him, it could smell the thief. Startled, Bilbo frantically tried to escape, but the sound of rolling coins exposed his footsteps. Smog immediately knew the treasure in his hands. It turned out that the dragon was aware of the One Ring's power of invisibility. Suddenly, 
Bilbo's face contorted in pain as he envisioned the ring's malevolent influence. Struggling, he decisively took off the one ring, but in doing so, he exposed himself. He assured Smog that he wasn't there to steal but merely wanted to witness the dragon's magnificence with his own eyes, which indeed surpassed the legends. This ass-kissing made Smog very happy, not only did not immediately do it to him, but also stood in the open space to show him the full body type. During their conversation, Bilbo unintentionally caught sight of the Arkenstone. He used words to distract Smog's attention while attempting to walk closer and pick it up. However, Smog sent the Arkenstone flying with a single step. Oh, this day would come <laughs> for the pack of camping dogs. In the chase, Smog toppled a pillar, causing violent tremors that the waiting dwarves outside could feel. The aged Balin realized that Smog had awakened. He urged Thorin to enter the palace and rescue Bilbo, but Thorin showed indifference, he was only focused on the Arkenstone, and Balin believed that Thorin had completely changed. The Thorin he knew would have rushed inside without hesitation, Thorin stated that he wouldn't sacrifice the expedition for a burglar. Meanwhile, Bard from nearby Eskaroth sensed the commotion and knew that Smog was approaching, he retrieved the last black arrow left by his ancestors. He was ready to fight for the unfinished glory of his ancestors. Afterward, he planned to have his son distract the guards while he himself prepared to face Smog with the black arrow from the bow tower. However, before he could take more than a few steps, he was captured by the people of the town and thrown into a dungeon. By this time, Smog had already realized that Bilbo was in league with the dwarves and unleashed his dragonfire attack directly at him. Helpless, Bilbo once again wore the One Ring to disappear and escape for his life. During his escape, he coincidentally encountered Thorin, who had arrived. Breathlessly, Bilbo informed him that Smog was coming, but Thorin was only concerned about whether he had obtained the Arkenstone. Indeed. Bilbo remembered Smog's words earlier. The Arkenstone would only make the dwarves lose their sanity. Thorin picked up his sword and relentlessly questioned Bilbo, while Smog chased after them. Following the sin of the dwarves, the dwarves and Smog already had a deep-seated grudge. Upon seeing Thorin, Smog angrily began to prepare its fire. You will The palace had already turned into a sea of flames. The dwarves sought refuge in a room. At this point, Smog's temper subsided. They attempted to quietly pass through the corridors towards the guardroom. A gold coin suddenly fell at Bilbo's feet, and he reached into his pocket, thinking it was the ring that had fallen. But when he looked up, he realized it was Smog passing overhead. Fortunately, Smog didn't notice them. They arrived at the guardroom and were astonished to see the remains of the last guards. Balin sighed saying that if they had hidden in the mines back then, they might have survived. Thorin, looking at the fallen predecessors, grew no longer timid and encouraged everyone to be brave and defeat Smog. They planned to lure Smog to the foundry and use the molten metal to melt it. They scattered and led Smog to the smelting room, but they encountered a new problem. They had no source of fire to ignite the furnaces. However, Thorin disagreed. He intended to provoke Smog and use its flames to ignite all the furnaces. Without hesitation, Thorin grabbed onto the hoist and jumped into the mine, narrowly escaping this danger. However, the danger was far from over. The evil dragon Smog opened its bloodthirsty jaws and launched a ferocious attack on him. As the hoist descended rapidly, Thorin found himself sinking deeper and deeper into peril. As the companions decisively cut the pulley, the descent came to a halt. With the other side of the crane fell. Thorin was also led to rise. Just as Smog bit onto the rope, the overhead mechanism couldn't withstand the pressure and began to fall. Thorin found himself standing perilously close to Smog's mouth. The evil dragon once again opened its bloodthirsty jaws, its throat's flames poised to unleash. While Thorin dodged, the apparatus above came crashing down, slamming Smog into the deepest part of the mine. Swiftly, the companions activated another pulley and pulled Thorin to safety. Enraged, Smog spewed roaring flames from the bottom of the well. The first furnace was ignited, and the interconnected furnaces followed suit. Under Thorin's orders, everyone started working in different areas. On this side, the Stout One operated the bellows to supply air to the furnaces. The fires burned brighter, and the cooling gold quickly turned into molten liquid. On the other side, Thorin instructed Bilbo to wait for his signal to operate the control lever. Smog broke free from the iron bars and made its way to the foundry. No! 
the scorching hot molten metal spewed onto Smog in an instant, even extinguishing the fire within its belly. Caught off guard, Smog struggled in agony. The other mechanisms also began to function. Enraged, Smog quickly regained its footing and charged toward them. Next, Balin used catapults to lure Smog into the long corridor. Thorin pulled the iron chains, opening the furnace, and the shimmering molten metal flowed downward. Thorin took a cart and shuttled back and forth beneath Smog's feet. Then, he pushed the cart into the molten metal and floated on it. Bilbo narrowly avoided falling from the collapsing platform and ran to lure Smog into the long corridor. The once empty corridor became eerily silent. Just as Bilbo ran into the corridor, Smog suddenly appeared from above. A gigantic banner dropped slowly directly covering Bilbo. Smog suddenly had an epiphany and changed its mind. Smog sensed that Bilbo had come from Eskaroth and believed that the conspiracy must involve the residents of the town. It turned his attention towards Eskaroth, ready to unleash wrath upon them. In order to protect the people of Eskaroth, Bilbo bravely stepped forward and declared that the town had nothing to do with the plot against Smog. Bilbo's earnest words only fueled Smog's determination. However, at that critical moment, a commanding voice rang out. Halting Smog in his tracks, Thorin stood atop an unfinished statue, relentlessly mocking Smog and proclaiming himself as the true king of the mountain. Enraged, Smog turned his gaze towards the statue. This is not your kingdom. These are dwarf lands. This is dwarf gold. And we will have our revenge. Thorin pulled a chain, causing the stone encasing the statue to slowly crumble away revealing a colossal golden dwarf statue. Even Smog straightened his posture, its eyes fixated on the sight before him. Suddenly, the statue's eyes began to melt away. A torrent of scorching molten lava rushed towards Smog like a flood, catching the dragon off guard and knocking his entire body down in the corridor. Smog was completely submerged in the golden molten lava, transforming the entire corridor into a pool of shimmering gold. The sudden silence did not ease the vigilance of the group, just as the crowd hesitated whether to celebrate the victory. Smog transformed into a gilded dragon. The malevolent creature burst through the gate and directed its fury towards Eskaroth. With a leap and a spin, Smog shed off the golden coating from its body, revealing its true form. A catastrophic disaster was imminent. Meanwhile, Gandalf ventured alone to investigate Dol Guldur, a long-abandoned fortress emitting an ominous aura of darkness. Using his staff, Gandalf dispelled the enveloping darkness. As he surveyed the area, a sudden assault came from above. However, Gandalf swiftly incapacitated the assailant with a single move. Gandalf pressed down on the attacker's head and began chanting an incantation, completely purging the malevolence within. It turned out to be Thrain, Thorin's father, who had gone missing for 60 years since being captured by Azag during their war. From Thrain, Gandalf learned that the forces of darkness were amassing, preparing to wage war and seize control of Middle-earth. Urgently, Gandalf escorted Thrain away, but they were ambushed by Azag before reaching the exit. Although Gandalf was primarily a melee spellcaster, he occasionally used teleportation. In an instant, they escaped to the exit. Closely pursued by Azag's ward cavalry, Gandalf managed to bring down a tower, obstructing the pursuers on the stone bridge and securing their escape. However, the danger was far from over. A powerful surge of darkness blocked their path. The approaching figure was none other than the yet-to-be-formed primary antagonist, Sauron. Thrain was unable to leave any final words as Sauron drained the life out of him. With Gandalf on the brink of exhaustion, Sauron pressed him against the wall, and Gandalf released a final spell to resist Sauron's dark magic. His staff burned to ashes. Ultimately, Gandalf was overpowered and pinned to a cage suspended in midair. Ruthless orcs viciously swung the iron cage towards the ground, coercing Gandalf to surrender the three elven rings, including Narya, in his weakened state. Gandalf was unable to mount a counterattack, just as the orcs prepared to sever his hand. The elven queen, Galadriel, appeared. Her immense magic unleashed shockwaves that emanated from the castle's surroundings. I am not alone. At this point, Saruman had not yet turned into a traitor, 
It is only during the subsequent events of the Lord of the Rings, when tempted by the power of the One Ring, that he is fully transformed into a major antagonist and joins forces with Sauron. After bidding farewell to the brown-robed wizard, Gandalf hurries off to meet with the dwarf. The brown-robed sorcerer handed Gandalf his staff. At this moment, Gandalf does not know that the dragon Smago has awakened and that Eskaroth is about to face a catastrophic disaster, 